the last concept uh, when it comes to approximate integration, numerical integration, uh, for each one of our three methods, uh, we'd like to talk about the error um, in each for each one of them, right? So we'll start with the error of the midpoint. Whenever you do numerical anything, numerical integration included, right, you know that your answer is wrong. Uh, you know that it's not exactly that number that you found. Um, but usually it's close enough where it's going to get the job done. Um, but you always want to assess the maximum possible error after computing one of these um, in order to guarantee your findings. And, you know, usually uh, this sort of thing is highly applied. And so, uh, you know, you don't want to you want to know you're within a certain tolerance, if you will, of the exact value. So here's how we would find the maximum possible error of the midpoint approach, the midpoint rule. So we're going to refer to it as capital E sub M, right, the error of the midpoint. And we put absolute values around that. We always think of error as a positive number. It's like a, like a distance. And we're going to say, okay, we know the the error is less than or equal to this value here that we're going to calculate. So it's like this value is the maximum possible error. The actual error might well be less than that, so hence the less than or equal to. All right, and it's capital K, B minus A to the third over 24N squared. And you're like, okay, what are all these pieces? Well, the A and the B are the limits of integration. Right, integrate from A to B. The N is the number of subintervals. So we know those things. We know A, B, and N, right, just from the integral itself. The K is the difficult part. What's up with the K? Here's how you find K. The absolute value of the second derivative of your function is less than or equal to K for X somewhere between A and B. All right, so we're going to try to find the value of x between a and b that would maximize the second derivative. What value of x in here makes the second derivative the biggest thing possible? And if we find that number, then that's what we're going to take as k. That's what we'll plug in right there. Again, we say less than or equal to k um, because we could take k to be larger than this number because it's larger than this. But we're just going to take whatever that number is to be k, and then that goes in here. All right. We're going to do an example with midpoint rule in just a moment. Let me tell you about the error of the trapezoidal and the Simpsons, too. They are similar, very similar formulas. A couple details change. For the error of the trapezoidal, um, right, capital E sub T in absolute values. Um, the numerator is identical, but now that 24 becomes a 12. So actually, for trapezoidal, um, if, you, if, if all that changed was a 24 to a 12, then the denominator got smaller. So that actually means the possibility for the error got bigger for the trapezoidal. And all the same stipulations for finding the K um, as midpoint. And then finally, Simpsons. Here's Simpsons. So uh, the error of Simpsons. Okay, a little bit more changes. Now instead of a third power, it's a fifth power. But we divide by 180 into the fourth. So the effect here usually is that now the denominator got so much bigger the error is a lot less um, and even though we're putting it to the fifth power you know here we went from a square to a four and a 180 so usually the the effect is that our error really shrunk um, and you notice out here we're not talking about the second derivative anymore we're talking about the fourth derivative we maximize the fourth derivative for x between a and b but similar thinking Okay, now as you look at that, that might be a bit intimidating. I can certainly understand why, 
you know, finding that K, right? That's the weird part. So let's do an example with the error of the midpoint. And wouldn't you know, we're going to use the same integral that we had earlier. We've been using the same example this entire section. For the integral from 1 to 5, the natural log of x to the third plus 2 dx, find the upper and lower bound for the error of the midpoint rule with n equals 6. Okay. So we're going to find the error, um, and then we're going to use our original answer um, to find the upper and lower boundaries for what the error, um, for what that answer could be. Okay. And we'll stick with n equals 6. So to begin, you know, we can do the easy part. Um, the absolute value of the error of the midpoint, less than or equal to. Let's plug in our b, our a, and our n. k minus 5, k times 5 minus 1 to the third over 24, 6 squared. And we'll get 4 to the third, okay, 64. Multiply this out, you get 864, and that will reduce to 2 over 27k. And you think, hey, most of the work is done. I did a, b, and n. All we got to do is find k. All right, but that's the whole problem, obviously. <laughs> Let's see how this plays out. Um, we find the minimum value of k. Right? We could pick something bigger, but the minimum value of k like shows us, um, you know, those the maximum possible error. It's kind of something, right, the thinking there. All right, how are we going to do that? Okay, so it's all based on the function, right? Our function here is the natural log of x to the third plus 2. Now, this is all based on the second derivative. So we need to find the second derivative. I'm not going to go through that step by step. I trust you guys can perform a first and second derivative and simplify. There's no reason to go through all of that work here. Though it's not a short amount of work, that's for sure. It would take you a few lines. Um, but let's just cut to it. Um, f double prime of x would equal 12x minus 3x to the fourth all over x to the third plus 2 quantity squared. Okay. Now, what do we do with this? We want the value of x, where x is between 1 and 5, that maximizes the absolute value of that second derivative. What value of x on 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 5 maximizes the absolute value of our second derivative? OK. In order to answer that, we need to think of this as an absolute max or min problem. Okay, so that's a Calc 1 topic. Uh, finding the absolute max or min was one of the applications of derivatives. Here it is right there. Find the absolute max and min of f double prime x. Now, the reason we want the absolute max and absolute min is because we have an absolute value. Right? We don't just want to find the absolute max because it might actually be the min that creates the larger absolute value, right? like a larger negative number. Right? OK. Now, if you're wondering how you go about finding an absolute max or min, uh, if you don't remember all that well from calc, usually we found the absolute max and min of f of x. You know, here we're finding it of f double prime x. So the way we need to proceed um, is to take a derivative. If you remember, you, you begin by finding the critical numbers, or sometimes called the critical values or the critical points. We need to find the critical numbers for this function. 
Well, in order to find the critical numbers for this function, we need its derivative. Yes, we need to find f triple prime of x. Okay, now I've done the work here, right? That derivative takes, takes a little bit of effort, but certainly we can all do that. So f triple prime 24 minus 60 x to the third minus 18 x to the sixth all over, this is simplified by the way, x to the third plus two to the third. Okay. Ooh, and the work is really starting to pile up here. Not every problem is gonna be this challenging with its derivatives, but we might as well see one of the more challenging ones here as an example. Okay, so if I know that derivative, remember to find the criticals. We need to set the derivative of our function equal to zero. And we also need to consider when the derivative of our function does not exist. And you're going to see my work here out on the side. I'm just going to show you everything I've got at this point. Actually, let me cover this up. It's a little bit much. Okay, so when does our derivative, right, if we started with double prime, then the derivative is triple prime. So when does our derivative equal zero? So you think, well, that's really when the numerator here equals zero. Okay. And it so happens to turn out that there's no solutions for this of x between one and five. So if there's no solutions for that, for x between one and five, then we can just forget it. That doesn't provide us any information. So then consider, okay, when is the derivative? f triple prime, does it ever not exist? Think, okay, well, that's when the denominator equals zero. Kind of interesting, right? Numerator equals zero, denominator equals zero. Well, what do you think about this one? I mean, we could kind of go through the steps a little bit easier here, um, but Again, this is not going to give us any solutions for x between 1 and 5. I think this, there is there are solutions here, um, but they're negative. So the point being, I know you guys could solve that. The point being, there's no solutions for x between 1 and 5. Okay. If there aren't any solutions there or there, then what do we do? Remember, we consider the endpoints. Okay. So we'll take the endpoints, 1 and 5, and we'll plug them into what we're thinking of as our original function, f double prime. So f double prime 1 and f double prime 5. And it turns out, I think it's, it's off the uh, screen now, but f double prime 1, plugging 1 in right here, will give you exactly 1 as a result. Plugging in 5, not quite so clean, gives you negative 0.113. And then the question is, okay, we found the max and the min. Which one of those makes the absolute value of the second derivative the biggest? Well, which absolute value is the larger? And of course, it's the absolute value of one. So it happens to be the positive in this case. So, you know, we kind of think like the absolute value of each one of these, right? And then we'll take that absolute value, that's our K. So it was already positive. If that were negative, we would take the positive version to be the K. So we got k equals 1, and now we can quickly finish off the problem. If k equals 1, then it's, you know, going way back up here, it's 20, 2 over 27 times 1. So the error of the midpoint is less than or equal to 2 over 27. And if we wanted to round that maybe to four decimal places, like we were doing our answers earlier, it would be 0 0.0741, and we got it right there. Now, if you wanted to think, what are the upper and lower boundaries? 
then we would need to take our answer and add and subtract our error. So that's the answer that we got previously for the midpoint rule, 12.8768. So if we add and subtract that value, these are the upper and lower bounds, right? The lower bound and the upper bound. So we know the actual value of that definite integral falls somewhere between these. And that's not bad, right? I mean, 12.8, 12.9, I mean, we got it pretty good. And so maybe, you know, hopefully this would tell us, you know, our answer here. We know it's, we know it's not perfectly right, but if it's at least within a certain tolerance of uh, our, our needs for whatever our application is, then we know we're safe. If this allows to go outside of that tolerance, then you know, uh, we need to rethink uh, our approach here. Okay, um, that is our section.